When our eyes open in the morning, thank you is on our lips. When our tables are full, we say thank you all the more. As our cups overflow, Lord, teach our hearts to be open to share with those who just need to know that they have not been forgotten, not left behind. We thank you because you are faithful and you've been with us from the time of our birth until our last breath. You have been with us, Lord, from the beginning of your church and on and on. You have never forsaken us. We give you thanks because your love is everlasting. Your mercy and your justice are wed together. And you hear us right now, Lord. You hear our concerns and our prayers. You know what is in our hearts. We pray for the leadership of this country, the leadership of this world. Somehow touch them, Lord, that they may be able to have a vision that goes wider than just their office, but see that we all need each other. And as we care for one another, we care for your environment. We care for the earth upon which we live. We care for the air we breathe and the water that we drink. We care for the land that grows the food and upon which we live. We ask you now, Lord, just to guide us through this time of worship together, that what we do here may uplift you, lead us into the world as disciples of Jesus Christ. But most of all, we give you thanks just for being who you are and allowing us to wake up, give you praise, and serve you in spirit and in truth. We are your people, and you are our God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This is back? my season for grace, for favor. This is my season to reap what I have sown. This is my season for grace, for favor. Stressing, I got a seed in the ground. 
Sabbath will have no end, and we'll do nothing but sing and praise his name. And when he says, well done, my race, my race will be won, and I'll walk around, walk around heaven all day. We now want to honor our deceased members for 2019. And we'd like for a family member for each of these uh, members to come up to light the candle. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things. And in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That is everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself in all things, whether on earth, or in heaven, making peace the blood of his cross. Of which I, had, I, of which I became minister, and according to the divine office, which was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mysteries hidden for the ages and generations, for now made manifest in his saints. To them, God who choose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches and the glories of this mystery, which in Christ, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning every man 
and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man mature in Christ. For this I told, striving with all energy which he mightily inspires within me. The word of God. We are honored today, as Reverend Fisher has said, to be blessed to have our bishop, Paul L. Leland, uh, to be our speaker today. Uh, he was, you'll find his full bio uh, in the church books, so I'm not going to read the entire thing he said that wasn't necessary. Uh, but uh, Bishop Paul Leland uh, was assigned to the resident bishop of the Western North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church in July of 2016 and, be and began his duties on September 1st. He was born in Washington, D.C. and graduated from North Carolina Westland, Duke Divinity School, and North Carolina State University. I'm a graduate of Carolina, so. <laughs> <laughs> and then he was ordained by Bishop Robert Blackburn in 1976. He is, uh, he, he is married to Janet Elaine Dow, and they have three married children, Rebecca, Nora, and Paul Andrew, and he has six grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And so, without, uh, that enough? That's good, okay, all right. Uh, so we welcome you, and uh, after the choir, I think you'll be the next voice we hear. Thank you. I've lost some good friends along life's way. to heaven to stay, but thank God I didn't lose everything. Lost faith in people who said they'd care. In time of my crisis, they were never But in the midst of my struggle 
Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, the one through whom all things were created, for whom all things were made, and by whom all things are held together. He is the one who has created all things in heaven and on earth. He is the one who is the firstborn of the dead, and therefore, as Paul said in the scripture lesson, for this reason I became a minister. Actually, that word can be translated servant. For this reason, we became servants of the gospel in order to admonish everyone, to teach everyone, to present everyone mature unto Christ, that the word of God might be fully known. And then Paul has this wonderful phrase, if you were listening to the scripture lesson, for this reason we work. This is why we toil. This is why we labor. And today we sit here in celebration of 153 years of our forefathers and foremothers whom invested themselves that the word of God might be fully known. This is why we became servants, to admonish everyone, to teach everyone, to present everyone mature unto Christ. And this is why we continue to labor. And this is why we continue to toil. Congratulations on 153 years of ministry. And I know that some of us are sitting here today thinking about our forefathers and our foremothers that would love to have been a part of this celebration. But for whatever reason, they're not able to join us this morning. They're not here for this celebration. And yet we stand on their shoulders. Matter of fact, as I traveled the annual conference to which I'm appointed in the United Methodist Church, our 1,100 United Methodist Churches just at our conference alone, I've discovered that most people don't even know what the bishop does. <laughs> what the bishops do is that they travel the area to which they've been appointed preaching and teaching the faith of Jesus Christ. They convene the churches together to do ministry that no individual church could do by itself, like the development of our hospitals, our retirement homes, our children's homes, our camping ministries, our universities, and our colleges. Matter of fact, I'm humbled and honored to be here with your pastor, Donnell, and his wife, Kathy, and with the newly elected president of Bennett College. Dr. Suzanne Walsh, because Bennett College was birthed out of this congregation. It was birthed out of this congregation. This is why we labor. This is why we toil. This is why we work, to make the word of God fully known, to admonish everyone, to present everyone mature unto Christ. Now, when the children were gathered up here in the front this morning, uh, I couldn't help but think about when I was at Elon, North Carolina. Back then, when I started that church, it was Elon College, North Carolina. So you know where it is, right? That's where my first church had a seminary. And the children came forward, and I was going to preach on the sovereignty of God. And I knew those little children didn't understand the word like sovereignty. And so I asked the children when they gathered in the front of the chancel area, do you know what it means to be in charge? And this little boy whose nickname was Jay Bubba, honestly. I know, all in North Carolina. I get it. He said, yes, he said, in my house, my daddy's in charge. And that was kind of the reaction of my congregation. And then with perfect timing, he said, but my mama's the boss. <laughs> well, I don't know what Jay Bubba is planning to do today, but he's probably planning to run for the governor of North Carolina. <laughs> because he knows what it's like to have one foot in his daddy's world and one foot in his mama's world. And that's where we are today with 153 years of celebration of the life and ministry of this congregation. We have walked with one foot in the world of holiness, glory, honor, praise, worship. And then when we leave this place, we step with another foot into the world of despair, worry, brokenness, worry, fear. We walk with one foot in the world of holiness and one foot in the world of uncertainty. Like Jesus on the mountaintop in the transfiguration. Let's build three booths here. And Jesus said no. And then he goes back immediately down into the valley in order to cast out demons. 
There is a file that I keep, and when I come across these wonderful things that inspire me, I put them into that file, and there's a poem in there that doesn't have an author. I don't know who the author is, but it's a little short poem that said, as the covered wagon rolled and pitched along the prairie track, one sat looking forward and one sat looking back. One saw the bright horizon of a bright and better day, and the other saw the disappointing road as it too slipped away. As the covered wagon rolled and pitched along the prairie track, one sat looking forward and one sat looking back. And we walked with one foot in the world looking back on the years that brought us to this point. We can see God's hand in so many events in our life that brought us to this moment. What is harder for us to see is the very presence of the mysterious God who is with us in this moment, preparing us for the future that is yet to unfold as one sat looking forward. I wish that when the children were gathered here, I, I know this sounds simplistic, so please forgive this old bishop for saying this. I, I wish that I had a large um, jar of ink because my grandchildren love that pastel chalk. Have you seen that? You mark the driveways up with it and the sidewalks. And if I could take a piece of thread and tie it around that chalk and just lower it down into that large jar, jar of ink, you know, and I know, that the longer it's left there, saturated, bathed in the ink, that when you pull it out and pop it open, the ink is saturated to the very center and core of the chalk. When we bathe ourselves in the means of God's grace, which the church historically has called the means of grace, prayer, worship, sacraments, covenant groups, where we watch over one another in love, when we immerse ourselves, bathe ourselves in the means of grace, it leads us into the means of mercy, kindness, and compassion. Because the way in which we live in community with others is a spiritual issue. It has to do with the reflection of the heart. And as we enter into the means of grace, prayer, worship, scripture, sacraments, covenant groups, and we begin to practice the means of mercy, we are shaped into the image of Christ. And as we are shaped into the image of Christ, and this congregation at St. Matthew's immerses itself in corporate prayer, in worship, in scripture, in sacraments, we begin to practice the means of mercy in the midst of the community into which we step. The means of mercy and the means of grace. We become the body of Christ. Now when the people who are newly ordained in Western North Carolina Conference gather with me, I gather the young clergy every year. I learn so much from the young clergy, Don Allen. They're still teaching the old bishop. But somebody made the comment uh, that the local church was the hope of the world. And another newly ordained minister in our conference spoke up and said, I don't believe that. Everybody was kind of surprised for a moment and said, you don't believe the local church is the hope of the world? And he said, no, when I look at my congregation, it ain't the hope of the world. <laughs> <laughs> but it led us into a much richer, deeper, reflective conversation then at what point does this local church begin to become the body of Christ? When do we move from just families gathering on Sunday morning in holiness in the means of grace to begin to practice the means of mercy and we begin to practice the means of compassion and kindness that others might know the compassion and kindness of God through us? And here's how it looks for a congregation. Dick Wills was appointed, by the way, that's one of the tasks of the bishops, is to ordain and appoint our pastors. Uh, in our Methodist family, we don't wait for the church to say we would prefer to have Peter, Paul, James, or John, or Ruth, or Naomi to be our pastor. We still use the biblical model in our Methodist family. Acts 13 after says after worshiping and praying and fasting, they laid hands on them and they sent them off. Or as Paul said to Titus, I've left you behind that you might appoint the elders in every city. And our Methodist family still uses that biblical model of appointing elders in every city to every congregation. So Dick Wills was appointed to Christ United Methodist Church in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. 
I don't know if any of you visited that church. It's a large church. And um, when he went there, that church had been declining for a number of years. But I call it stable, but slowly declining. <clears throat> Meaning that if you looked at worship today and compared it with a year ago, it was about the same number, only a few less today. If you looked at Sunday school today and compared it with a year ago, it was about the same number, only a few less today. It was stable. It was happening so gradually that people didn't realize that they were declining. But after 10 years of decline, the congregation realized we are moving in a direction to which we are not going to be able to recover. And that's the point at which Dick Wills went as the pastor of that church. And as that as he began to pull people together in the means of grace, particularly in small groups where they prayed for one another and watched over one another and thought about how they could serve their community, the church began to grow and they began to find vitality and began to have a witness in the community. And somebody asked Dick Wills, Dick, when did the church make the turn? And Dick Wills said, our church made the turn when we stopped praying are you listening to me? Mm -hmm. When we stopped praying, Lord, bless our worship service, bless our Sunday school, bless our vacation Bible school, bless our disciple Bible study, bless us, bless us, bless us. And instead we began to pray, Lord, help us to bless those whom you are blessing. Mm -hmm. Do you hear the difference? This is why we labor. This is why we toil. This is why we work. This is why we became servants, to make the word of God fully known in order to admonish everyone, to teach everyone, to present everyone mature unto Christ. And here's how it looks in the life of an individual. I was the pastor of a church in Raleigh, North Carolina. <clears throat> when the economy gets very, very difficult for our families, people come in off the street to the church looking for help. Don't they know? I was in the study of the church. There wasn't another soul in the church but me. This man came into the church and he scared me. I could tell he had been living in his car or he'd been living on the street. I, I couldn't tell, but he looked mean and he scared me. And when he asked me for money, the first thing that went through my mind is, I'm in this church by myself. There's nobody in this building but me. When he asked for help, I gave him everything I had and everything I could find. <laughs> I took him to the kitchen. I gave him every popsicle out of the refrigerator. If we had it, I gave it to him. And over the course of a few years, he kept coming back because he, he didn't have the people skills to hold a job. You could have given him a job, but he... But he was not dependable. He couldn't hold a job. And so he kept showing up, always needing help. And he told me that his name was Frank. He said he was from Virginia. He and his dad didn't speak together any longer. And every time he came, I tried to help him. One Sunday, a family from that Elon church showed up in Raleigh to be in worship with us. I didn't know they were coming, and they wanted to take my wife and me to lunch. And so I said, you go ahead and save a seat for me at the restaurant, and as soon as I lock the doors and everybody's gone, I'll join you for lunch. And as everybody was leaving and I'm locking the church, I see Frank get up out of his old beat-up, rusted car, and I began to pray, please, Lord, not today. I do, I do not want to deal with Frank one more time today. Now, you have to understand, this is after several years of dealing with Frank. I had a relationship with Frank at this point. Frank said, I need to speak to you. I said, Frank, I'm sorry, I got friends from out of town. They're waiting for me at the lunch. And um, uh, I tell you what, tomorrow's Monday. It's a national holiday, so this office is closed. You come back on Tuesday, and I'll help you like I always do. Frank said, no, I need to speak to you now. I said, Frank, I don't have time today. You come back on Tuesday, and I'll help you. I got in my car, and I left. When I got home, one of my daughters was watching for me out of, the, out of the parsonage window. And as I pulled into the driveway, she came out of the house and she said, Daddy, 
I'm so glad you're home. This man came to the house today. He scared me, and we were here by ourselves. I didn't know whether to open the door or not. I said, I know. His name's Frank. I told him to come back on Tuesday, and I'll help him like I always do. Next morning, on Monday morning, there's a knocking on the front door of the parsonage, and it does not stop. And as I'm working my way through the parsonage, and I get to the front door, there's Frank. He said, Paul, I need to speak to you. And I said, Frank, come on into the parsonage. And we sat down. And he said, I, I had to see you today because I, I had to come and tell you that I've got a job in Emporia, Virginia. I was a surprise. I'm calling my dad. And my dad's calling me. He doesn't know what to say to me. I don't know what to say to him, but we're, we're talking together. He said, but the reason I needed to come and see you is because... I wanted to tell you, and I'm going to tell you, just like Frank told me, I have met Jesus and he has saved my soul. Mm -hmm. And that's how simply he said it. Uh, I know we don't use that kind of um, language or vocabulary in the church today like we did in the 1940s and the 1950s. I understand that. We don't hear that as much. But that's exactly how he said it to me. I met Jesus and he has saved my soul. And then he says, in the Holy Spirit, I have to be at my job first thing in the morning, which is why I need to see you now, but the Holy Spirit has directed me to give my tithe to our church. Now, did you catch that phrase, our church? I never rolled my bills, my, my money, but you've seen people that do that, and he had rolled his bills, and he counted out his tithe, 1400 Sixty-eight dollars and some odd cents. His tithe to our church. When I got in the pulpit the following Sunday, the pastor of my congregation, I confessed to my congregation that Frank had shamed me. I thought I had a front row seat on what his life was going to look like for the rest of his days on this earth. And behold, the old had passed away and the new had come right before my eyes. And then I told my congregation, Frank has not only shamed me, he has shamed our entire church because we come here week after week after week giving our little bit to support missions and we have forgotten we are the mission to rescue the perishing, to care for the dying, to snatch them in pity from sin in the grave, to weep o'er the airy one, to lift up the fallen like Frank. To tell them of, don't know that him? To tell them of Jesus, the mighty, to save. We got to learn that hymn. That's, that's a great hymn. This is why we labor. This is why we toil. This is why we work. To bathe ourselves as often as we can in worship, prayer, scripture, sacrament, the covenant groups, the means of grace. Looking at the Sunday school lesson just before I come to church once a week ain't going to get it. It's not going to shape me into the image of Christ. I've got to be bathed, saturated. That leads me into the means of mercy. Congratulations on 153 years of ministry, of birthing ministry, including Bennett College. What a legacy. What a contribution to young women in our historically black colleges that always give a chance, always provide a chance. It's more about their development, leadership, than it is about the academic framework, giving everybody a chance. But like today, when we celebrate 153 years, I'm thinking of Jacob. It took Jacob 30 years to come back to Bethel. I won't say that story. You know that story. And when he came back to Bethel, where he had had the vision of the angels ascending and descending and built the altar of Bethel, he said, surely the Lord was in this place. We may, we may not have been gone from this place and this church for 30 years. Let's review the familiar surroundings. Let's renew old acquaintances. Let's start new friendships. But let us not forget to bow at Bethel and remind ourselves, surely the Lord was in this place. And this is why we labor. And this is why we talk. Congratulations. Amen. Amen.